Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Gary Rose, who is VP of New Nuclear Growth at OPG. Uh, Gary, a, a very warm welcome to Decouple. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here today. Looking forward to the discussion. It's it's been a long time coming. I think we met for the first time uh, at COP twenty. I always get the, the numbers mixed up. COP twenty seven in Egypt. Um, and we've been kind of circling each other, so glad to finally make this happen. Um, you gave us a fantastic tour of the Darlington mock-up. Um, and today we're definitely going to be focusing uh, in part on the refurbishment program uh, because it is my thesis, and I'm be interested to see if you share it, that Ontario is the best equipped jurisdiction in the Western world um, for the deployment of new nuclear Um I'm not sure if you agree or not, but we'll we'll get into that. Um, so your career, I mean, that was a very brief intro, VP New Nuclear Growth. Um, you've been, I think, probably at Ontario Hydro because that's what it was before it turned into OPG. But you've been there, what was it, 35 years. So just take a minute or two um, to, to walk us through um, your career path um, and sort of some of the things you've been involved with before before getting into this VP New Nuclear Growth thing. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, 35 years at Ontario Hydro OPG. We'll call it OPG from this point forward. Um, I was a, uh, a, I did two semesters of food and beverage management at college and decided I did not want to work every Friday and Saturday night for the rest of my life. So ended up at OPG in 1988 as a clerk typist. Wow. Um, I've had a fantastic time at OPG, great company to work for. It really given me opportunities to grow. Um, first five years, I was in energy management. Ironically enough, back then, I was uh, working to promote uh, energy efficiency for the purposes of not building new nuclear plants. That was the That's goal. Awesome. So it's kind yeah. of ironic where my career has come to at this point, where I'm out there promoting new nuclear growth. And right. to your earlier point, I think we are certainly ready and the best equipped to, to execute new nuclear projects in, in the future here in Ontario. Um, so what happened in the middle of all that? 1993, declared surplus when we stopped the energy management program, ended up in corporate finance, knew nothing about finance, decided I better go back to school, did my commerce degree, uh, my accounting designation, worked in corporate accounting, got involved in projects in preparation for Y2K, um, thought I better learn something about projects, went and did my project management professional certification at uh, Durham College, which I am now the chairman of the board at Durham College, which is a nice uh, full circle as well. Wow. Um, so, you know, first half of my career really in, in finance. And, um, I think that defines me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I think people would conclude that my bias is cost, right? To me, it's all about how much does it cost, uh, and, uh, what are the value proposition of, of spending said money, so to speak. Right. Right. Um, in, uh, in the early two thousands, I, I, uh, you know, I moved to, uh, to Pickering, I was on the Pickering return to service project where I learned an incredible amount in uh, um, concepts like earned value management, uh, uh, project controls, construction uh, management. Uh, that was my job. I was in this intersection of finance and project controls. And it was really a unique time because I, you know, finance is all about how much money I've spent against a budget. Project controls is how much work have I done against that budget? So the ability to measure day-to-day -day work really changed my outlook on, on things. So. Um, I spent uh, a few years in uh, Pickering a return to service. Of course, we decided not to proceed to to restart um, uh, units, uh, Pickering units uh, two and three. Yeah. I ended up in our in our uh, nuclear project uh, and modifications organization, which does modification based projects. I, uh, I led a project called Cost and Schedule Improvement Project, which was all about getting much timelier cost and schedule information to be able to evaluate performance of project delivery. You couldn't wait till the invoice showed up to understand where the project was at. You needed to know where the project was at real time so you could take real time actions and make real time decisions. Um, so that has been really instrumental to, to what we're going to talk about today. Um, 2008, I shifted to the Darlington Refurbishment Program. I was the first uh, executive on that team uh, that, uh, that has actually been, been here through the, the total duration of, of Unit 2. And, and the, uh, refurbs, the refurbs haven't started until, I mean, I'm, I'm actually not sure on the dates, but 2008, that's, that's a long time before we started actually doing the work, right? In 2008, it was really, uh, we were asked to do a feasibility assessment on the decision to, to refurbish or not to refurbish uh, both Pickering and uh, Darlington at that point. Right, in time. okay. Uh, so I was involved in that business case in 2009. We 
decided to proceed with the refurbishment of Darlington. So we, we sanctioned the project and uh, put a project charter in place. Uh, I was the ultimately the vice president of, uh, of uh, project planning and project control. So I was accountable to establish the baseline for how we would measure performance on, on the project. Uh, that culminated in what we call a release quality estimate in 2015 that we took to our board and to our shareholder for approval of a, of a $12.8 billion project. So we set a cost and schedule baseline in 2015 at this time of release quality estimate. We took that to the Ontario Energy Board and had it evaluated there. And that baseline is how we're measuring our performance. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll talk about how that performance looks. I'm for sure. sure. For sure. Discussion and how it is that we were able to stay on that baseline. The, the, the current refurbishment program at Darlington is ahead of schedule and on budget, um, which is not said too often in the same sentence as nuclear. Right, um, right. So we certainly have a very positive story to tell. And, and you're right, we spent seven to eight years planning this project. And, uh, you know, my, my adage is uh, planning doesn't guarantee success, but lack of planning, planning guarantees failure. And I, I truly, truly believe that. So it's planning... You need to plan, and then you have to have meticulous uh, execution against that plan. Um, so that's a little bit of the career summary. I then transitioned over the last couple of years to support the decisions with respect to the decision to proceed uh, with the DNNP, the Darlington New Nuclear Project, and the selection of the General um, GE Atashi uh, BWRX 300 project, which was transitioned over to the Enterprise Projects Organization here at OPG. And I've transitioned to be the Vice President of New Nuclear Growth, where my job is to look at what other nuclear opportunities exist in Ontario, how do we approach those projects, and of course we support uh, uh, other provinces in the pan-Canadian uh, SMR approach, and through a subsidiary called Laurentis Energy Partners, we're also supporting uh, new nuclear deployment in places like Poland, Estonia, and a number of other discussions going on with a number of different countries like Australia, Czech Republic, and, and others. So like what I'm struck by here is um, your background, you, you mentioned kind of, I think, food and beverage management, um, and you've moved from that over your career into managing, you know, some of the large, I think the largest infrastructure project, uh, contemporary infrastructure project in the country. You know, I believe these refurbishments are, as you mentioned, about 12 billion. I think that that divides down to about 3 billion per reactor. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. Like you, you hear a lot about nuclear, how people can get in. And maybe this applies just to utilities in general, but how people can get in with a basic level of education and, and really level up. And it seems like you're a walking, talking example of that. Are you are you the exception to the rule here? Or is this a more uh, common phenomenon? I, I certainly don't want to be the exception to the rule because I think we're going to need all types of people to make a, a nuclear program successful. It's not just engineers. It's not just operators. It's uh, it's finance folks, it's HR folks, it's media folks, it's it's all all kinds. You know, I was blessed to be in a company that recognized um, my my desire to want to move forward. And, you know, the company supported my education. I had leaders that saw potential and gave me opportunities to do new things. Um, and I worked really hard at uh, at uh, learning from others and um, you know inter- implementing what I thought were the best strategies to go forward with. Uh, um, you know, I, I share my story to as many people as I possibly can. And my message is decide what you want to do and go after it. Don't wait for somebody to come and ask you to do something. Let your, let your leaders know what you want to do. Network, have a plan, be honest with yourself about what you need, what development you need to get there and go after it. All right. Well, that's, I think that's a great uh, summary of, of uh, kind of who you are, what you've been up to, or the little motivational speech tacked on the end. I love it. Um, so again, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, the eras, I guess, um, that your career spans. So 1990s, from what I understand, not a great time for nuclear. Um, Bruce A. was laid up. Um, my, my understanding, you know, it's very vague and patchy here, but, you know, Con- the things that contributed to that were kind of underinvestment or disinterest by the provincial government at that time in nuclear. Um, and again, this this thesis of being the best equipped um, jurisdiction in the Western world now, um, there's been a lot of changes. So just wondering if you can just briefly give some context of why things were so bad in the 90s. You know, there's this really interesting dynamic between coal and nuclear that you watch 
um, over those years where, you know, Bruce A is laid up and no surprise here. We need base load power, coal skyrockets. And, you know, finally we got rid of, of coal using nuclear. Uh, but just walk us through some of uh, the, 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 the context and how we've gotten to where we are now, where, where we're the best equipped. And Chris, I, I don't know that I'm, I've got the perfect history of understanding the 90s. Of course, I was in corporate finance and, you know, it was ironic. You know, I, I spent my first 15 years in the company or 13, 14 years in the company in corporate. Um, I had not been inside a nuclear plant until uh, 2003. And okay. what was really amazing for me is that that first day of walking into that nuclear plant and sitting at a meeting. And, and during the time, uh, there was actually a, a, a safety incident where the whole whole organization rallied around it. It was really, it was like I, I had woken up into this, this production world that was very new to me. Um, I'd been into a, you know, financial role, very important role, but, but certainly not connected to the production. So when you look back and think about where I started energy management, we had the, it was called the demand supply program at that point, this expectation that there was going to be growth in the, the, uh, in the, the, the generation need. And, uh, and we had just come off of Darlington that was, that was expensive due to st uh, stop, start, stop, start, yeah, uh, yeah. right? Uh, which you know uh, accumulated huge amounts of of, uh, of construction interest, which really increased the cost. Um, that is not a good way to execute a project. Um, so certainly, there was a time of uh, of why would you invest in new nuclear at those types of costs? Uh, yeah. But I think what happened is uh, is that uh, the the demand never materialized, and you know, our economy shifted. Uh, we lost a lot of manufacturing capability. You had some financial crisis at those points in times. And, uh, and, and I think in parallel to that, there were some struggles in, in the maintenance of the units that we had. And, you know, we had 18 operating or sorry, 20 operating units in, uh, in Ontario at that point in time and as, at a declining energy demand. So uh, I think the, the companies, we laid up some units and focused on core units to increase our, our capability. That's, that's my recollection and understanding of it. Of course, in time, we, we started to improve our performance uh, in managing and operating those, those projects. And we are now, of course, uh, you know, recognize this uh, top tier operator in the world of both Darlington and, and Pickering. And I'm sure Bruce is in similar, similar vein, but we went through a period of laid up, didn't need the generation, then a period of restarting those, those, those reactors, especially during the time of, of, uh, closing down our eight gigawatts of coal and, you know, creating a clean air environment in Ontario. We, we started Pickering, Bruce restarted their units. That was the, that was the yeah. reason why we were able to, to meet the, uh, the, um, the, the, the energy offset by closing down, down coal. So, um, you know, I think it was a time of a different time. We, we learned from that time. I think we, clearly we've improved our performance. Uh, we've got, uh, um, 18 operating or under refurbished units here. In Ontario right now, world-class performance. I think both uh, OPG and Boost Power have demonstrated that we can execute refurbishment projects well. And uh, that's given us the credibility to be able to do other things. I think if we failed to execute refurbishment, I wouldn't be having these conversations about new nuclear. Right, right. So I want to I want to get into refurbishment. But first, I think like there's this interesting sort of three phases. And phase one is the building of our fleet. Uh, pretty impressive. Um, you know, 20 units commissioned in around 20 years. Um, we've done some of the math comparing um, the can-do build-out to other, you know, mega projects when it comes to Canadian energy. Um, and, you know, in terms of the output of our can-do fleet, it's greater uh, despite the James Bay project, you know, being a higher capacity. We run our can-dos a little at a higher capacity factor. So that's that's pretty remarkable. And they were both built over a similar time period. So that's that's been something, you know, a little side analysis that we've been doing and, and found to be very interesting. So we have this you know, very proficient, um, you know, building of the fleet, as you mentioned, things get a little snagged up with Darlington. Um, and then I think we're in present moment in that refurbishment moment, which is kind of gearing up our capabilities. And then the third phase here is is building new nuclear. And that's that's pretty exciting. And we'll get into that later. But being in this refurbishment phase um, and, and your expertise lying there, simple question, like what is a what is a refurbishment? What is a can do refurbishment? So I can do, so the, uh, the design of the, remember, I'm a finance guy. So yep. I've picked up, I, tell you, I picked up the technical knowledge by asking questions about scope that relate to cost. And, and listen, sometimes it's the best thing because I get an engineer on and they're going to go into some micro detail here. So, so enough of the humility. So the design of a can do reactor is like limiting component is the pressure tubes, right? Due to hydrogen uptake or, 
or, ex, or uh, extension of the of the uh, of the, um, the pressure tube within the calandria tube, and the potential for um, uh, cracking, breaking uh, upon touch, sagging over time, different uh, technical stuff, much way beyond my ability sure. to comprehend. But I think that's the general uh, storyline. So at a, at a midlife, by design, at midlife, you need to replace those uh, those uh, pressure tubes, calandria tubes, and feeder pipes in order to extend the the operating life of, of that reactor for another 30 plus years. So um, when we started to evaluate this for, uh, for, for Darlington, um, you know, the, the, the timing for the, for the um, refurbishment of those units was in that 2018 to 2020 timeline, but you can't do them all. You can't refurbish four units overnight. So you have to start planning early and start staggering or staggering when you, when you do these refurbishments. But, but the essence is, we're refurbishing those reactors, replacing the, the, the feeder tubes, the sorry, the uh, pressure tubes, the calandry tubes, and the feeder pipes, uh, in order to to allow 30 more years of, of operation. So, how do we do that? We we uh, drain, we defuel the unit, we drain the unit, we separate the the unit that we're refurbishing it from the containment system of the other operating units. We remove all of those those um, calandria pressure tube feeder pipes. We do. Uh, Calandria inspections, we put those new uh, Calandria pressure tubes and feeder pipes back in, uh, test, refuel, commission, restart. That is an essence okay. of the critical path. The Coles notes. While you're doing so, the critical path, of course, you're doing other things that, that make sense to do while you're in a, in a long outage. Uh, you're doing turbine upgrades. Uh, you're doing balance of plant uh, uh, refurbishments. You might be doing uh, safety upgrades or new systems, et cetera all kind of off critical paths of, uh, of the refurbishment. But, you know, one of the, the lessons of, of project execution is don't overcomplicate your project and protect critical path. Don't let something else become the critical path that is not necessary. So we can get into some of that detail. I, th I think something interesting here. So um, compared to like the, the other, and it gets, it's, to me, this is fascinating, right? Because, you know, there's, there's been about five reactors that have been economically viable um, two of them have sort of fallen out of favor, you know, the Chernobyl reactor, the RBMK and the gas graphite reactors, partially because they have no option for refurbishment and they have a lifespan of about 40 years and then you can't do anything with them. The, the PWR, the BWR, you know, this is your, um, pressure cooker <laughs> type reactor. Um, the rate limiting thing there is, is the pressure vessel. Um, my understanding is once that's pooped and we don't really exactly know when, and, and these plants are getting extended, extended, um, you know, generally speaking, that's that's the end of life thing. But with Candu, we can keep replacing these. Um, lots of places we've done one refurbishment. People are saying maybe we could do a second refurbishment. Maybe we could extend these plants a, a really long time. Um, and and I've seen it sort of in the in the OPG um, public relations stuff. You know, we're restoring these reactors to an as new uh, uh, state. Um, you know. I've also heard people say we're restoring them to a better than new state because we've learned things, improved instrumentation, improved alloys and things like that. Um, is that, is that your impression as well? Or are we just being, uh, you know, a little too enthusiastic, uh, you know, can do fanboys here. Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, unit two that went back into service in, uh, in, uh, June, uh, June 4th, 2020, I think operated something to check on maybe off a couple of days, but in the big picture it's rounding 563 days, uh, of operating from from returning to refurbishment, a 44 month refurbishment operated for 563 days. I think that's quite incredible. It's the best in in the industry. Um, so that's just a testament to the quality of of those units coming back. The new units, you know, you have there's shake it down. We actually planned uh, uh, in our in our business case um, outages in the first couple of years because the expectation was you would have some challenges coming a unit back with a brand new core. And, uh, and so we planned that in. We didn't need to draw on any of those. It was, uh, the quality was, was that good. And you're right, we did make alloy changes to the, uh, to the, uh, the feeders and, the, and the, the pressure tubes themselves and to the, 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 the garter springs or annulus spacers that separate the, 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 uh, the pressure tube from the calandria tube. Um, and, and, and the, the um, capability, the technical capability uh, to test our welds today, the radiography techniques that weren't available when we built the plant, uh, uh, the quality inspections to such tight tolerances um, are incredible. Uh, that, that, that the, the amount of detail that 
goes into that, I'm of the perspective that we have a much better quality core than we had probably in original construction. So does that mean we should potentially be able to get longer than the nominal 30 years out of these units? I, I, time will tell, but I'm a believer that we will. What's your response to, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, and you'll hear a lot of media figures asking this question or making this comparison. Um, you know, they'll say, listen, I, I uh, have a Dodge Caravan, you know, 2008 Dodge Caravan. I wouldn't want to be driving that thing any any longer. What do you think the problem is with, you know, the comparison to the car metaphor for candy reactors and refurbishment? Um, is there a better metaphor uh, that you use just in terms of public communications? You know, I, I mean, I've used the car analogy. Even I think that's a man thing to do, right? So uh, just default to that. And, you know, uh, the way I looked at I looked at my, my explanation of car analogy is we're replacing the engine. And we may be doing some upgrades that Dodge may not have had uh, had uh, seat belts the time it was issued. We're putting in seat belts for improved safety performance. But we're not replacing the, the tires or the brakes. That's ongoing maintenance. Um, so the core... You know, and you, you could argue that we also, if the chassis is the turbine generator set, we, we did some upgrades and maintenance on that. So, so you know, I, I don't think that you can just replace the pressure tubes and the calandry tubes forever. I'm going to do this three, four, five, six times. There will be other life limiting components. But again, getting back to the, the design of the of the Candu reactor is a nominal 60 year life with a midlife refurbishment. It's not a, a 30 plus 30. And so it was the design, it was designed that way. Um, there will be other things that will need to be evaluated beyond the pressure tubes, um, the calandria vessel itself, the concrete containment structure that surrounds it, and, and other systems to really make that decision. And that's going to be quite a bit of engineering analysis. Um, there has been no uh, unit refurbished two times yet. Right, uh, right, right. So that, that analysis will need to be done, but, but uh, I'm sure in time somebody, we will, somebody will do that analysis or we will do that analysis. And, and evaluate that, but uh, but refurbishing a, a unit is uh, at least at the state that we've done it now is is the most cost economical thing that you can do. It's it's uh, it's uh, from a levelized cost of energy perspective. Uh, everything we've seen, it's uh, it's a lower lower cost, better value to the ratepayer than than a new unit. But it, you have a limited time span. So as we grow and need more generation, you can't just keep refurbishing units. You've still got to bring in new generation as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only other things I've added to, you know, when I, when I get that question is that, you know, yes, this Dodge Caravan is, is doing highway driving. It's always in the right lane. It's always driving according to the, the laws of the road, 90 kilometers an hour, essentially forever highway driving. And it gets an oil change every, you know, 5,000 kilometers or something. You're right. On cruise control. On yeah. Cruise yeah. Control, right. Like the best thing to do is just let it operate. Yeah. Right? That you can let a nuclear plant operate uh, is the best place for it to be. That's why, you know, base load 24 7, 365 a day power. It's the only thing that we've got that can, can do that. So, refurbishments haven't always gone well. Um, you mentioned being around in the, the Pickering days of, you know, Unit 1 and 4 being refurbished. Um, what, what went wrong and what lessons have been learned such that, uh, you know, you have several units finished um, or through the refurbishment at Darlington and things have gone ahead of schedule and stayed on budget? I can go on about this. I can make this your longest podcast ever. Uh, in, in what we've done, but I'll try and get to the really key selling sure. points. First off, Pickering A RTS uh, was a restart, not a refurbishment. So the restart in the 2000s uh, was a, um, a, originally it was planned to be, I don't think it was a, my, my numbers may be off, but I think it was a billion dollars to restart all four units and end up being a billion dollars for each unit. Um, it, uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, we did not replace pressure tubes or calandry tubes or feeder pipes. That was not, but it was that units were laid up. Um, they were laid up in some respects in haste uh, and perhaps not done in a way to make them, make them easily restart. So you have equipment that was decaying, valves, piping, et cetera. That was really what electrical, that, that's really what the restart was about is doing an assessment of, of all of that information from a system that systems that have been laid up in haste in some cases and, uh, uh, and uh, not, not fully thinking about a restart and the timing of the restart when I say in haste. Um, so um, totally different project, um, but it has some lessons learned from it 
um, that I would say are lessons learned from many mega projects. So when 95% of mega projects go bad in terms of cost and schedule overruns. Um, Pickering A Restart was, was one of those. Um, you know, if you really be honest about it, the first number we put out, uh, we didn't complete the scoping of the project. We hadn't done a proper estimate of the project and uh, didn't have contracts in place, didn't have execution models in place. Uh, we started the project with an expectation of what it was going to cost. And as we got into it, we started to understand that better. I know in the, uh, in, and I wasn't there in, in uniform, this is not an excuse. I was back in finance doing some good work there, but I joined uh, in the planning unit four was wrapping up, which was the challenging unit. Uh, we were getting into unit one and uh, we did set a new budget for unit one. I believe it was 965 million dollars for for the restart of unit one and we were we were a little bit over that but in a in from a margins uh perspective against that estimate we were in pretty good shape but certainly overrun from the estimate that i put out years earlier without the benefit of scoping and proper cost estimating schedule development like you never you never want to go over budget but it, it was interesting we were looking at the finance uh, uh accountability office um you know, when they were assessing, are these refurbs uh, viable? What is the risk of them? And, you know, they're like, if the project goes, you know, 40, 50 percent over budget, we're looking at, you know, if nuclear is currently eight cents per kilowatt hour going to like eight point seven cents. And I mean, that that's not good, but it's also not as bad as, as one would think, because we're spreading the cost out over a, a lot of kilowatt hours. Um, so not not to make excuses, but it's you know, I think a lot of people think it's devastating if these projects do go over budget. Um, but yeah, let's let's pivot to Darlington and your analysis of why things have gone so well. First off, you break my project management heart because you know we don't set we don't do plans to overrun. I mean, the goal is yeah. to be on plan, right? So that's that's the first message. So that is the goal. It's always to be on on, on plan. That's that's what we we set out to do here at refurbishment. But shifting to refurbishment, uh, and we'll let you answer ask that that question there. But uh, you're right about the costs, right? So. When we did the analysis of refurbishment, $12.8 billion to refurbish four units to get 30 years of operations at 93 to 90, I can't remember the exact number, but 90-ish, 93-ish percent um, capacity factor, which was 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 based on the operating performance of the Darlington units at, in the past. If you did better than that, you lower your costs ultimately. Um, if we were a billion dollars over, Right. So the, 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 in 2015, when we set the RQE, the, the budget, the result was a levelized cost of energy at less than eight cents in 2015. So that's probably 10, 11 cents now um, in, in refurbishing those units. Um, a billion dollars over on the capital cost of the refurbishment um, would have had about a third of a cent to that LCOE. So not dramatic, right? So to your, your, to your point, right? It's not a dramatic. And the reason for that is that about a third of the capital costs for the LCOE was related to the refurbishment, uh, where two thirds was related to the, the operational performance over the life of that asset. So, um, so we we had to evaluate both. New build, um, the capital cost is more because of course you it's a brand new investment from grounds greenfield up. Um, it's probably about two thirds capex, one third operating, and, and over a certain period of time. The operating costs from a net present value perspective doesn't matter, right? I mean, the, the discount rate, it's, it's so far out there, the time value of money, it, it becomes irrelevant. Okay, interesting. So let, let's, yeah, let's focus now on, on, you know, Pickering, we had some troubles with those refurbs in the early 2000s, late 90s. Um, what's changed now? Um, I think you take a lot of pride in this. Um, you, you said there's a seven, eight year planning period. I got to visit this mock-up. Uh, maybe describe that for listeners. Um, and, you know, two or three of the, the biggest uh, takeaways. I'm sure, as you said, you could talk about this for hours, but um, highlight, highlight what, what have been the, the really proven elements of the success story. You know, we, we reviewed this book on project management by uh, Bent Flevberg. You know, he, he has this database, as you were mentioning, 95% of projects go over cost, over budget, or don't actually deliver the value that they're, uh, you know, plan to deliver. Um, nuclear has these fat tails. It, it, you know, has been done well and on budget, you know, in country over country. Um, but when it goes wrong, you know, it can go badly wrong. Um, and, and the, the cost of overruns can be, can be quite massive. So, um, you know, I think again, this is one of the factors that makes us the best equipped, but walk us through what are, what are the kind of top three 
parts of of what we've learned um, and what we're what we're applying at Darlington to to get these things ahead of schedule and on budget. Let me talk to you. I was going to break it down to three categories: planning, meticulous execution, and post execution lessons learned. Okay, let me just, right. let me bring it. Back. First off, with planning, um, we you know this mega project planning execution of mega projects, whether it's nuclear or not, is a problem. Ninety five percent of them fail. So when we went into the refurbishment, the first thing we did is we wanted to learn from mega project experience. So we looked at what were the what were the successes or failures of of Heathrow Airport, London Olympics, uh, nuclear plants, our own projects, uh, our hydroelectric projects, our nuclear projects. There's lessons to be learned from all of them, right? So um, and I would I would probably boil it down to a few points. Uh, take the time to understand your scope. If you, you can't estimate a project if you don't know what it is that you're doing, right? Um, contemplate, uh, I want to uh, refurbish my bathroom. Well, do you want linoleum floor or ceramic tiles? Without understanding that scope, you cannot estimate or plan these jobs. So understand the scope. We went through an exercise of what, what, what is required? What do you have to do to restart the unit and allow it to operate for an additional period of time versus what can you do in a normal maintenance outage? So it's a really a, a must. Uh, we kind of broke it down to you must do it from a regulatory perspective. You must do it to allow it to operate, continue to operate, or there's value enhancing reasons to do it while you're in a refurbishment state. If it could be done online, we descoped it because, uh, or it could be done in a normal outage, we descoped it because you need to manage the complexity of the amount of work that you need to do. We needed to protect the critical path. We wouldn't allow anything on the project that was that had that was off critical path that had less than 30 days float to critical path i.e you had basically you had a 30-day window if it went long and if there was any risk that it could go beyond 30 days we were very careful about putting it in the project or looked for different ways of doing it breaking up the work so that we could always maintain float to critical path we protected the critical path at at at, at all costs right we, we really made sure that that, that and that was it. That was OPEX from uh, other projects, from other refurbishment projects that uh, they ran into trouble with the critical path. But if, a, if critical path had gone well, they would have run into trouble for the non-critical path stuff that would have become critical path. So, so understand your scope and protect that. Without that, you can't do a schedule or an estimate. So when you get the scheduling, uh, our lesson learned is you need to have one schedule. We were... Uh, a general contractor, so to speak, we were we call a, a multi-prime approach here, where we had multiple EPC vendors. One of them being the the EPC vendor that uh, did the actual retube and feeder replacement work itself, which was which uh, which was Canatum, and um, a joint venture between SNC Lavalin and, and, and Acon. Um, we we were the because we were the owner and ultimately accountable for execution of this project. We said everybody will use one. Uh, work breakdown structure, cost breakdown structure, set of codes, and one schedule in our Primavera planner system. Um, we, when I, I visited Vogel many years ago in the middle, and of course they were in commercial discussions, and uh, the, each of the vendors had their own schedule and wouldn't share it with the other because they were in commercial discussions. So the owner had no true visibility where the project was at. We weren't going to make that mistake. We ensured that we had one master schedule that fed into OPG, so we had complete visibility and all the costs lined up to that. Now, what were the durations on the schedule? We built the mock-up, right? The reason why we built the mock-up is we had uh, tooling that was developed uh, that was factory tested, and we all went out to demonstrate to, 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 uh, to, uh, to see the, the, the factory acceptance tests that were done before those tooling were delivered to our site. We then uh, used our mock-up. We took that tooling to the mock-up. We ran it through its processes over and over and over and started to understand what is the time that takes for these, these tools to do whatever step it needed to do. What was the maintenance time, the human interface time, et cetera, et cetera. And from that, we started to add all that up together on a, on a single fuel channel. And you times that by the fact you're doing 480 fuel channels, and maintenance windows, et cetera. It started to develop the schedule that way. So a meticulous amount of detail in the schedule. Um, and that allowed us to do, I used to ask this question as a project controls uh, manager, director, ultimately VP at some point, what are you counting today? I used to ask the project manager this, what are you counting today? And if they didn't know what they were counting, how, were, how could they know where their project was at? 
So it was a simple about, you know, if I had a schedule that said today I need 10 people to install six widgets and I got 20 people and only installed four widgets, I have a problem. So we developed our schedule and our resource profiles to be able to evaluate performance on a daily basis. We ran on our critical path. Uh, every morning we had a production curve that showed us what our plan was, how many uh, units we were supposed to have installed, how many people were on that job. And if we weren't hitting the mark, we had a discussion as to what the issues were, what were the actions that we needed to take to, to get back on track. So it's that meticulous execution, that oversight. You need a plan to be able to do that. If you don't have a plan and don't know where you're supposed to be at, how can you evaluate your performance against that? And uh, I know I'm beyond three. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say the next one is, uh, is uh, risk management. Uh, anticipate that you're, and this is, uh, you know, if, uh, a lot of projects think about risks at time of business case. We, uh, we documented all of our risks. We broke it down between what are schedule risks, what are discrete risks, events that could happen that are independent of schedule. And what we said is, uh, what are the mitigation plans that need to be put in place for those, those, those uh, risks? And if those mitigation plans were in place and fully mitigated, what is the residual risk and probability and residual risk of, of that. And we, so what we did is we added costs to prepare the mitigation plans and we added contingency if those residual risks came true. What we then did is we said, well, what's the trigger date that I have to have the mitigation plans in to avoid that risk? And we managed that hard. We made sure that there were mitigation plans on the shelf or built into the plan overall. And when risks happen, we had plans in place already to deal with them and kind of had the foresight. I'm not going to say we were perfect. There were things that came up that we didn't anticipate, but because we had anticipated some risks and mitigated them well, we didn't have the consequence. We didn't see the consequences of that. So in the end, we were able to balance out the contingency. So you you got to you got to really focus on risk and planning, the contingency that you require to mitigate those risks, the actions you would take to mitigate those risks when they come in, and you didn't manage. You need to do risk management every single day as you you go through the, this this type of project. And I would say the last thing from a, sorry, we keep, the last item from a, this would be uh, the contracting model. Um, we started off in the refurbishment with an EPC model mindset. We were the owner. We were going to oversee um, contractors to do work and we were independent of them. They would submit us an engineering drawing. We would review it and send back comments. They would revise those, send it back to us. We'd review it again, send back more comments and, you know, time went on. So this is crazy, right? We obviously have some skill sets as the owner that the vendors, we could help the vendors if we integrated the teams. So that was a shift to this from a, this EPC owner oversight model uh, to one where we started to integrate the teams, like where it made sense. We said, who is the best athlete from the vendor community, from the owner's community? Uh, let's put them together um, and let's motivate everybody the same way. So. This one team um, terminology came out of the refurbishment, right? Well, quite frankly, it came out with my kids that played hockey in this day. It was one team, one goal was the mantra in the dressing room. We brought that to the refurbishment program and created this one team concept where we would have vendors uh, and OPG in, the, in a room working to solve a problem. Uh, we didn't know who was who, but it didn't matter. They're all motivated on the same goal. And that is the... Pre that is the premise of the integrated product delivery model that we now have for the DNMP. It, it, it is a continuation of what we, we learned in, in, in Darlington and, and move forward. So uh, I, don't, I know there's a lot there. You could probably unbundle yeah. this and talk about yeah. We could talk about this, this, this all day, but but the end of the day, you got to do all of those things. Then you need to capture the lessons and get better on the next unit. And I do really want to pivot to, to New Nuclear since you are the VP of, of New Nuclear, but um, this has been fascinating. One thing that that came up again in this Bent Flavberg book, um, you know, how big things get done, is the concept of modularity. Modularity is this, you know, it's it's all the rage right now. <clears throat> but you know, Cando is the only reactor that has a modular core, and a lot of the work you were doing was modular and repetitive. Is that part of you know what lays behind the success in terms of being able to do the same process over and over again and optimize it? Certainly, we we used modularity to a point where it made sense in in this uh, in this refurbishment. We brought in instead of uh, replacing components, you brought in skids that you could basically that had all the components on it. So they're fabricated outside, brought in, 
and uh, and connect it up. So they were put in position, and then you had a window to to uh, to to connect them, and then you could then take the time to dismantle the other stuff. So it saved you, you know, critical path time in that. Um, but but uh, I think modularization, especially when you shift the new nuclear, is is going to be a uh, uh, Going to be a game changer. I think it'll be something that we'll get better at when you get many. Like I think talking about one nuclear plant doesn't engage the supply chain to actually optimize the this modularity. But I think when you start talking about a fleet of reactors and supply chain start to perk up and become interested in how do I become innovative to do to create production capacity to modularize components and ultimately re- increase quality and reduce costs and shorten schedule times and and, and, and costs. I think that is certainly the path going forward. And I, I listened to you, one of your recent the couples where the gentleman referred to LMRs, large modular reactors, which I, I thought was quite uh, unique. And I've used it a couple of times since, and I've caught people. I, I think, you know, modularity is not a, not a unique to small. Um, in small modular reactors are done by the fact that they're smaller, simpler, therefore modular become more predictable and and uh, shorter durations, uh, but it's all about predictability. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done in large modular reactors as well, especially if you're going to install a fleet, which may is something that Ontario will have to consider based on the IASO report and the, the scenario which requires up to 18 gigawatts of new nuclear. So I'm going to pivot any second to you know applying lessons from the refurb to SMRs and new nuclear. No secret that I'm, uh, you know, a huge fan of the idea of a Pickering refurb. Uh, just very quickly, in terms again, because there's some changes. Uh, you know, it's an older plant, more complex systems. Uh, you know, the degree of confidence um, in the Pickering refurb certainly, I think, would be not controversial to say that it's it's higher based upon the success at at Darlington. As you were saying, if if Darlington you'd lost control of costs and and schedule, um, that would really make the Pickering refurb less likely. I know this is kind of a behind closed doors scene as you guys work on your um, viability plan. Um, any any comment there at all? I'll, I'll let you off the hook if you have no comment, but um, just curious. But, uh, I, I've always got something to say about most things. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not obviously in the team. The team is, uh, I actually um, did do some initial um, feasibility planning of this this decision to continue to evaluate the option to refurbish, uh, to, to, to evaluate uh, the refurbishment or restart of uh, our the refurbishment of Pickering B, we'll call it. Uh, and, um, you know, my perspective is, you're right, we have a, we have a, a team on Darlington that, um, you know, we spent 44 months, spent 3.4 billion. This is all public. We're a very transparent, open, regulated company. I have all this information goes in front of the OEB. So, uh, you know, first unit, 44 months, 3.4 billion. Second unit, Likely going to come in at approximately 36 months. Not done yet, but 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 uh, tracking very well. That's a that's a significant improvement, and uh, and 2.6 billion dollars. Uh, so you know quite a substantial less less. Um, so you have a team that has learned a lot on unit two. They they documented 3,000 lessons. We used the COVID period when you know there was a delay. We decided to postpone the start of unit three. We kept some of the, 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 the senior trades folks here, the, the, the superintendents, the foremans, et cetera, and we asked them to go through their, their construction work packages with the lessons learned in hand and be creative and, and find ways to improve performance on the subsequent units. And, and, and you know, if Unit 3 lands where we expect it to land right now, they will have done it better than the, what we call the working schedule. This is, means that they didn't even need to use the contingency. The project's not done. There's still risks. There's startup risks. Uh, we're replacing the turbine control system on unit three. So there are risks that are unique to three that weren't on two as well. But 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 I tell you, the performance from the lessons learned on unit two and the application of those lessons learned on unit three is incredible. And it's going to get better on uh, on unit one, which is, uh, you know, in the midst of its removal phase right now. And unit four will start uh, nominally in July of this year. Um, assuming unit three gets done by that time and uh, it's it's going to get better and better and better. So that team that is top performing right now, they're, uh, they're, that team needs to then move over to Pickering. And that needs to be, you know, my perspective, that needs to be Darlington units, five, six, seven, eight from, a, from an application perspective. It's probably not as simple as saying that, but we have a team that is highly capable 
and uh, motivated to continue on this great performance that I think would, would make Pickering more attractive today than it might have been when we were thinking right. about doing this 10 years ago. I mean, and it just speaks to, I think, the human factors element of nuclear. Um, just, it's hard to, and I think it's often neglected, um, the value that lies there. And, you know, certainly in, in my amateur analysis of you know, what went wrong at Vogel um, and over in Europe with the EPRs, I mean, first of a kind's challenging designs potentially, but it seems like one of the biggest factors was uh, that, that human factors element. And I guess it's proof of point that we're seeing those improvements unit to unit um, you know, happening in real time. Um, and when you have you know, this number of reactors to do, you're, you're gonna learn a lot of lessons and bring schedule and cost down. So very I, I cool. Was talking um, about, I built two, sh two sheds in my life, right? I built two sheds in my life. The second one went a lot better than the first one, right? I mean, we can all relate no to those types of stories, right? Yeah, so for that's sure. true in this industry as well. And I think it's gonna be true to SMRs or LMRs um, right. that uh, the more we do, the better we're going to get at this. And I think that's been our experience to date. Uh, you know, we need, we will learn things. The first one will be more difficult than the second one. That's okay. We'll learn things and we'll apply those lessons and we'll get better the second time, the third time. So that tenth of a kind cost for SMRs or LMRs is going to get better. Your sense before we get to uh, SMRs, and it's kind of a teaser, and I, I do want to spend some time there. I hope we have enough time that we can go a bit over. Um, but what's your sense of, you know, we, we move the refurb workers over to Pickering. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of lessons for, you know, other reactor design um, coming out of that, just in terms of the general culture of excellence um, that's delivered these projects. But in terms of uh, some of those can-do specific skills, um, does the refurb work, um, if we do choose to do large modular reactors and those large mo modular reactors, those new builds are can-do, um, how well does the refurb work prepare us for new build work at can do obviously there's a bunch of civil engineering concrete pours and things like that that we've not got the familiarity with but in terms of that reactor component turbine stuff that's maybe can do specific how well does that experience and that you know excellence in the human factors that have been developed um uh, apply to potential new build can do i mean I, I like your perspective it's really the culture of this right it's that that, that you know um if we entered into a new build project and forgot all the lessons learned that we learned on refurb, I would be a betting man to say we will fail. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of tra transference of, of the methodology and that, that drive for performance, setting yourselves up to be able to manage performance very well. You know, I would also say that, you know, when we started the refurbishments back in, uh, you know, in uh, 2010, 2011, we started planning and started scoping this and started to look for vendors that could provide the, 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 the materials that we needed, uh, engineered materials or commodity materials and that we were, we had gaps because the industry was, was dormant for such a long period of time. And we went out and talked to vendors that had done this work in the past. And in some cases where the tooling was in a warehouse somewhere or a different company had bought it and, and, and got re-engaged supply chain and, uh, so that is certainly um, a help as well going forward. We have a strong nuclear supply chain. Uh, we have a strong um, uh, planning management protocol, and we have a large number of trades who have uh, under, now understand what it means to be working on a nuclear project, the quality that's required on a nuclear project, the safety that's required on a nuclear uh, project. In, in unit two, in uh, in 2017, which was the first full year, we had, I think it's over 13, um, what we call maximum potential for harm. Uh, we got lucky, right? We, we really could have hurt somebody. And to where we, we go years without one of these now. Um, You're talking about so injuries to workers, uh, is that? Is injuries that to workers, right? We, we, we've been had a great record. I think we had one lost time accident in the, the two units of refurbishment where an individual uh, uh, tripped and, uh, and, uh, and broke their knee. Uh, so walking accident, uh, but beyond that, uh, no lost time accidents in, in, in nuclear and an exceptional for like 10 times or more better than the general, um, commercial, um, construction right. world. But we had people come into this project that came from an office building where the safety practices and protocols were not what we expected in nuclear. That fleet of trades people have learned that we expect them to operate safe. We don't. We do not want them to to make risk decisions in the field, and uh, we keep them safe. and And they're very appreciative of that. And I think of 
have grown to understand our bases and 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 buy into this this nuclear safety culture, which is incredibly important. Um, so I think we have good processes, ability to execute. We have a great supply chain. Uh, we have great people uh, that understand what nuclear safety culture, culture, safety, quality, performance is to to execute good projects. So I think we're in a great. I you think you opened up saying that Canada is. Uh, Ontario is in the best position of anybody in the world to build new nuclear plants, and I absolutely agree with that. Okay, so the, the long-awaited pivot to talking about SMRs. Um, so just just explain, um, I guess, the underlying rationale. I, I've I've heard it described to me, especially with the kind of international collaboration that's occurring specific to the BWRX three hundred. Um, I've had the analogy of you know when countries develop uh, fighter jets, they often will collaborate, you know, amongst a, num- a number of countries and, and spread out some of the risks and some of the development costs. Um, does that apply? And I mean, I'm, I'm putting too much into one question here, but I guess the rationale for the SMRs and, and I guess some of the collaboration that's occurring, um, you know, Ontario is taking a risk doing the, uh, development work on, on, you know, first of a kind. Um, if you could walk us through a little bit, the decision-making around, um, this pivot to, to SMRs and the X300. Yeah, so the, the big the big picture to SMRs is that uh, you know large large nuclear certainly struggled. Um, we didn't have a lot of great projects. I think we were the exception in Darlington refurbishment. The uh, the financial community uh, was I think in, would be reluctant. Uh, two years, I think it's in, maybe improving, but I think still I was at a you know when I first joined this team, I was at a conference and uh, there was a financial panel that stood up there and basically said we would never invest in large nuclear projects. For at least a generation, uh, because wow. of the experience wow. of, of existing projects, we're starting to show. We think we're the, the climate change, and you know the things we we heard at COP twenty seven is people are starting to realize that we need to we need to get into nuclear. It may require us to take in some risk, but the the value is just you know I'm not going to say this again. My project perspective, it hurts me to say this. There's value at any cost from an environmental social perspective, but we got to find a way to do them cheaper. And uh, and more predictable, and and I think there's there's ways to get there, but the shift to SMRs is that because of that, the shift to SMRs is they're they're smaller and and, and therefore will have um, they're simpler. Um, they don't have as many components, and therefore the construction durations instead of six, eight, ten years can be three, four, five years. Um, so that and alone, from an investor perspective, is less risk. So it's much more contained schedule. Uh, much lower cost point uh, because it's it's simpler, shorter, and uh, so and, and in turn you get a much more predictable outcome. Right? It's not as you know, large and it's a monstrosity of multiple large units. It, it can it can be much more contained. That's one thing why it's more more interesting. I think the modularization, the smaller, allows more vendors to get involved. And one of the one of the challenges I see with uh, large pressure reactor um, units is that you have a limited capability globally to to forge uh, steel and fabricate these large pressure vessels, right? We're small. We have BWXT here in Canada that can that can, uh, can manufacture these. They still need forgings, but they can manufacture these pressure vessels. So it opens up more vendors to be able to, to, to do this. More modularization because they're smaller, easier to move components, et cetera. Um, but, but the other reason for doing and getting involved in small is small opens up a larger nuclear market. There are jurisdictions that do not have the generating capacity for large nuclear. And that, that you know, it will be decades and, and huge economical changes in some of those countries to really need a, a large, you know, um, Saskatchewan and Canada province, you know, they're looking at it that way. They've got, um, they got sites, old fossil coal sites, uh, um, that, um, that you can replace with an SMR, right? The grid's there. It's uh, you know, they got many of these coal plants. Maybe I shift from Saskatchewan to places like Poland. They have sites that have coal plants that have 300 to 600 megawatt capacity. It's a little bit of demolish coal, insert SMR, connect to grid, and go to the next site. Um, it's that's the model that they want to get into doing the, doing in, in Poland. They're talking about up to 80 of these SMRs in the next number of. of Years. So, um, smaller jurisdictions that don't need large amounts of nuclear. So you open the door for that. It, it creates the opportunity to to connect to existing grid where you might have smaller 
amounts of grid there, like these coal plant replacements. So, um, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of advantages to 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 SMRs. Um, the question for large is, if I may pivot, is that uh, um, there are going to be jurisdictions um, that have high population centers that are going to need larger amounts of electricity, where we need to evaluate can can a larger unit uh, be uh, delivered um, with manageable risk at a price point that is less than SMRs? And that is, a, that is not an easy question to answer, uh, but that is one that we will have to answer and, uh, and we'll go through that analysis to understand. So obviously, um, you know, lower construction risk, um, you know, more enthusiasm from the finance community, I think demand is a big part of this as well and, and why there's a pivot to talking about, uh, we'll use the Mark Nelson term, large modular reactors. Um, you know, there's obviously, you know, as we see with the refurbishments, multiple units, lessons learned. I mean, the early, um, you know, our entire can-do build, we had these four or eight unit stations, um, you know, lessons and schedule improvements. You know, building the same reactor on the same site tends to tends to work. And if the demand is there, um, it seems like it can be large, but if the demand is not, then... You're not you're not going to be able to get those benefits. So that's that's kind of something that 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 fits in my head. Um, what was I going to ask here? Um, it seems like, and again, uh, I know you might be constrained in terms of what you can talk about, but uh, certainly OPG is is looking at moving out beyond Ontario in some way, shape, or form to lend that expertise to other uh, jurisdictions domestically. Um, and you know, I've got lots of folks um, that stop in with me and, and are you know meeting with uh, Todd Smith and meeting with you guys. Um, a lot of interest from around the world, uh, you know, Estonia, Poland, Australia, others. So tell us a little bit about domestic and, and international cooperation and what role OPG would have in that. So uh, I mean, I think your your point is 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 the point I would make. We have fifty plus years of nuclear experience in Ontario. Um, you know, operating a fleet of reactors. Um, we have great product experience uh, for jurisdictions like Saskatchewan that have recognized the need to get into nuclear or evaluating the, the option to go into nuclear. I know they have not made their, their final decision that will be made in 2029, but, uh, but certainly they've indicated the, the desire to move forward with nuclear and quite frankly, follow OPG's lead, same technology, um, after we deploy ours for all the benefits we've talked about through this entire discussion, right? They're not going to go first. They're going to learn from us and it's going to make their project more attractive. What best way to de-risk their deployment is involving and engaging with us. We bring operating experience. We're going to bring experience from, from this project. So I, I think that is, that is some really good synergies that act, actually will de-risk project deployment in, in both provinces. And, uh, you know, when you look beyond internationally in, um, you know, um, countries that we are, you know, friendly countries to Canada, uh, Poland certainly being one of them, you know, their decision to follow uh, Ontario's lead, uh, TVA's lead in selecting a, the same technology and the application of a standard design to the extent possible in North America and in, in, in Poland, their alignment with the Canadian regulator that was announced a few weeks ago, you know, they start the model, their deployment program on what we're exactly what we're doing here in Canada, and that's all to de-risk their deployment. And and so there's an obvious uh, reach out to us, and we have, like I said, we have a subsidiary of our interest energy partners, which becomes our commercial entity that is interfacing with Poland, Estonia, and, and others, um, to for us to help them in what it means to be a nuclear operator, manage systems, organizational structure, interface with the regulator, all those things we are bringing to the table. We can also bring our lessons learned experience from actually deploying the first BWRX. And we can also bring our lessons learned and experience from being an operator, whether we are training them to be how to be an operator, mentoring them through that or participating in a, in a larger role, time will tell. But, but certainly there's, uh, they're, they're, they're selecting the same technology and they're buying into a standard design for a reason, right? And that is to help de-risk their deployment. And by buying into a standard design with a standard regulatory framework, it'll also allow us to the creation of an export market for Canada, right? Standard design that's already been manufactured, a pressure vessel that's already manufactured at BWXT that can be built for Canada reactors, U.S. reactors, and Polish reactors, uh, at least initially, to help expedite their deployment. 
there, Europe is in an energy security crisis uh, that, that is, uh, you know, it's a whole podcast on its own. You've had those conversations. Uh, it's certainly uh, since the, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine and the, the, the climate situation there, they need to deploy these reactors as soon as they possibly can. Working with us, following our lead, will help them get there faster. So I'm curious about the technology choice um, and the decision making behind that. Um, obviously, there was a competitive bidding process for Darlington. You know, one of my concerns about SMRs has been that there's just a plethora of different companies. And, you know, the promise of economies of multiples over economies of scales is that we do the same unit over and over again. Um, what, what was the uh, rationale behind the choice uh, for the, the X300? We went through, uh, the, the, spent a couple of years going through I think a hundred-ish uh, different designs and different uh, uh, different levels of, of, of development. We um, we narrowed that list down to ten. We narrowed that list down to six. We then narrowed it down to three. So we went through this down select process. We then spent a better part of a year with three different teams working with each of three vendors and ultimately selected BWRX for a couple of reasons. One, BWRX the X is tenth generation design, so it's it's fundamentally uh, largely based on existing operating boiling water reactors in the U.S. And, and globally. It uses the same fuel that those larger reactors use and many similar components. So in a jurisdiction like us that wanted to get uh, be, a, be a, a world leader in this first of a kind, get it deployed at a site that was already licensed this decade, um, the BWRX is a very good managed risk for us. Um, again, you know, 10th iteration design, existing fuel, it, it's, uh, it's, its probability of success is very high and, and, uh, and deployment timeline based on design, et cetera, and this decade is very possible. Um, some other designs, which I think are, 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 are great, are, are probably not going to be deployable as fast. And so a little bit for us is, is wanting, to, wanting to have the first uh, you know, deployed this this uh, this decade. Uh, wanted to mitigate risk. Wanted a, a product that we could that we we thought was going to be successful and 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 gave us uh, economic value for 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 Canada. So that was ultimately why why we selected this. And there's no second guessing that we still believe today that it's a great choice. It's a great technology. Uh, we're seeing the the merits of us working with TVA in Poland uh, and the standardized. Uh, uh, the technical collaboration agreement where we all work together in a standardized design. Um, we're, we're seeing that. Meanwhile, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine has also impacted uh, many of those reactors with a supply of HALU fuel. Um, so if we had selected another reactor, we, would, we might not be able to deploy in the timeline that we want because of the, the fuel quality. So we recognize some of those risks going in. We did have no idea that there was going to be this war, but, but um, I mean, Luck is a part of it sometimes. Um, we select a reactor that already has an existing uh, uh, fuel supply. So you mentioned one of the key uh, success or reasons for success for the refurbs was this role of OPG integrating itself with uh, the EPC. Um, does that extend um, in the same way to um, units that you're not currently operating? Does that extend to uh, this SMR project in terms of just how it's going to be organized? I understand there's a consortium, SNC, BWXT, ACON coming together for this. What, what's OPG's role in this and why is that going to be leading question? But you know, why is that going to lead to greater success than, you know, again, what happened at Vogel? The, the, the basis of what we did at Darnton, like I said, we started off the traditional uh, multi-prime EPC model. Um, I wouldn't say that we weren't integrated, but we weren't as integrated as we are. We, we ended up in this one team approach in refurbishment, right? Uh, that model, um, uh, this integrated product delivery model, um, is what is happening at, at uh, the, the Darlington new, new Nuclear Project. Uh, and as you said, the consortium of, uh, of OPG, um, GE, H, the, the OEM for the, the design, the original equipment manufacturer for the design, uh, SNC Lavalin as the architect engineer doing the detailed design for construction of, of the unit, and then ACON as the constructor. Having those four parties integrated in a way that allows that the decisions are made in an integrated way with a product first mentality uh, is what it's all about. So they're all, 
They're all in it for the project to be successful. Um, the, if, the, if the project wins, they win. If the project loses, they all lose. So it's that alignment of goals um, and, uh, and this ability to work together in this integrated model where you don't have a designer develop a design and then throw it over the fence to the constructor who scratches their head and say, I can't do this. I cannot construct this design. You integrate them early with the same goal and you know, constructors are involved in the engineering at, at certain points to make sure that, that there is a successful solution that benefits the project as a whole. Um, that has that proven successful at Darlington, it's proven successful elsewhere, but that's the model that we're going forward with. So, so absolutely, it's an extension of what we did on refurbishment, and we think it's the, the best way to go on this type of a project in, 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 in this environment that we're in. Anyway. So obviously, there's, there's no competition with the, uh, the can-do supply chain, you know, being a Canadian reactor. Um, you know, with a 96%, uh, you know, made in Canada supply chain. I think that's, uh, I lifted that statistic from the refurbs themselves. Do you have any idea of how much of the supply chain will be able to capture or replicate uh, with the X300? You mentioned BWXT uh, possibly doing the, not the heavy forging, but building the pressure vessel. Uh, what's that looking like? I don't have the exact number, but I'll give you a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, um, our, we're motivated for um, domestic uh, adding economic value we're, we're, we want uh, we want uh, local localization to the extent feasible but not at the sacrifice of economics either right so you know localization is great but not to a point where everybody's building their own and you get no economies of scale I mean so you got you gotta balance that out you know what we're lucky is that because we have an established supply chain nuclear supply chain in Ontario even though the designs may be different right? But a valve manufacturer is a valve manufacturer. They can produce a valve for a can do. They can produce a valve for a, a BWX. Um, you know, we've obviously got the BWXT who have produced vessels for can do that are producing the pressure vessel for uh, BWX. The other thing I would say is that these projects are, are most of it, a large percentage of it, probably in the 70% is labor. Right? whether it's engineering labor, project management labor, trades labor. Um, so right off the gate, you get localization by you bring in local people to do this. The trades, the trade communities of those jurisdictions will, will execute these, these projects. The, the material component, the engineered components, you know, we should be in the 60, 70 percent, maybe even better than that for the BWRX. You know, that's not an official number, but I think that's the, the motivating number. We're going to wrap it up. I have, I have one last question, and I, my apologies for the kind of smorgasbord of questions here, but it's been amazing to pick your brain, Gary. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, the constructability, um, the smaller size de-risks things to a degree. In terms of <clears throat> the precedent for deploying um, small reactors from, a, I guess, more of like an OPEX and, 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 and return on investment value over the operation period, you know, like we've seen small reactors in the past um, on the grid. And basically everything under seven, eight hundred megawatts, say in the U.S., um, you know, has been shut down because it's not been economic. And obviously that's because of challenges with ultra cheap natural gas and other things. But small hasn't competed well with large. Again, not talking about construction, but just in terms of, of operations and ongoing uh, economics. Do, do you have any comment on that or, or reasons things might be different um, in this in this new climate? Um, like what, what percentage of the overall cost of nuclear is, is the construction? How much does that affect things over the life of the plant, I guess, is, is another part of this. Well, that's, that's a, so the overall cost of construction for the capital investment is probably in that 60% range, I want to say, right? Uh, 55, 60%. Um, the, and this is, this is, uh, I don't have the definitive numbers there, but but just based on my experience being in projects and 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 sure. you know I was involved in the original class five estimate reviews of, of this, uh, you know you're in that 50 60 percent range for the, the construction phase of of the project. Um, you know what it is over the life that's difficult because of course you got 60 plus well, years of operation yeah. that of course cumulatively adds up over time. You know when we, you know, but getting back to your real core of your question is really, it's an economics question, right? Uh, you're really saying, is there economical value in, in doing a small modular reactor versus a large uh, reactor? And um, our assessment has concluded that it has. Now, you know, one of the lessons learned, I would tell you from a refurbishment is that we did a phased process. 
Um, we prepared a class five feasibility estimate, took that to our board. We then did preliminary design. We did a class four, so better definition, better defined estimate. We took that to our board. We then did the detailed engineering, did a class three estimate, an RQE, we called that RQE, release quality estimate. We took that to the board. That was in 2015 for refurb. For DNMP1, that will be in 2024 when the design is done. At each of these stages, they're reviewing the economics of that first. And you know, we, we have approval to build one at Darlington, but we're planning to build four. We're sizing the site, uh, the, the, the infrastructure for four. And because of course, it's in the same way refurbishment. Refurbishing one is more expensive than refurbishing four. Building one is more expensive on a megawatt per megawatt basis than building four. So you look at it from a, uh, uh, that planning perspective of four, um, the economics are, are, are very comparable to, to other options and, uh, and, 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 and attractive. We've, we will do that evaluation once again. And at that point, we'll finalize our estimate and, and, and report on what that estimate is, but that'll be late 2024, at which point the design will be done. Another lesson, don't start construction without design being done. We will have the estimate done and a schedule developed that we can have confidence in. Uh, we will have the regulators license to construct application complete, another lesson learned. And we will package all that up and take that to our board and our final release quality business case and get their approval to proceed. If, if the numbers don't make sense, I would expect that they won't let us proceed. Okay, Gary, my producer's going to kill me. He's been trying to hold me back to 45 minutes. We're an hour and 12 in. Um, it's been really wonderful talking to you. I've, I've learned a ton and I'm sure uh, listeners will, um, you know, especially our Canadian listeners, but internationally, again, I think Ontario is in the spotlight, um, you know, poised to deliver the world's, uh, well, one of the world's first SMRs. There's been small modular reactors deployed in the past, but I guess in this modern era, um, and, uh, you know, really having come off, uh, and, and being, I guess, continuing to, to be in the process of these refurbishments, which, uh, again, in an era of mega projects going completely out of control, I think we've got something special here in Ontario. Thanks for joining us, Gary. No problem. I enjoyed it and more than happy to do this again, Chris. Wonderful. Look forward to having you back.